Merci, Nathalie. Je souhaite la bienvenue. Thank you, Nathalie. I wish to welcome all participants to this uh, session, this session on uh, proactive protection. My name is Alain Traoré. I work in development. And um, I work in the management of environment and development, and it's a pleasure to be your host and moderator for the next hour and a half. Today's, um, in today's session, we are going to discuss how communities can protect themselves and do so effectively. We're also going to discuss the actions carried out by the community and how these can contribute to obtaining results in terms of protection. It will also show how we can obtain results in terms of um, preventing violence. We also aim to strengthen the understanding of these approaches by presenting examples of different ways in which communities um, can protect themselves against armed conflicts and other violent situations together with their country and um, cultures. We shall present part of the um, experience gained by communities as well as the experience gained by local and national stakeholders. And we will also discuss the vast experience of participants in a comprehensive manner. As you can see on this slide, together with the agenda, we aim to begin by the with opening remarks by Sarah Broad. She comes from the Swedish Agency for International, um, International Development. We will then also briefly introduce the um, theme of different approaches towards protections carried out by communities. And then we will listen to examples from four local and national organizations from Colombia, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Somalia, and Ukraine. We will hear how they work with communities in order to prevent the um, generation of risks regarding protection. With this in mind, we will then put together discussion groups per region so that um, you can benefit from a more in-depth discussion. We will then come back together into the plenary to hear the main points that emanated from these group discussions, and we will then move on to final remarks. Before we start the presentations and the discussions, I would like to present the speakers in today's session. Let us start with um, Sarah Broad, who is who specializes in um, protection policy. She comes from the Swedish International Development Agency. The English acronym being CEDA. Then we have Amina Ali Abdi, who is a protection agent from Riado in Somalia. Then Lina Vanessa Reboyo um, Quinones, who is a direct, deputy director for projects in Apoyar from Colombia. We then have Tatiana Kutas, um, project leader from the 10th of April in Ukraine. And Yolanda Kalangaro Lusenge, coordinator from GADHOP from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And finally, Samuel, Samuel Chung, who is um, global cluster coordinator, who is um, a global cluster protection coordinator. Thank you very much for being here with you. And without further ado, I now give the floor to Ms. Sarah Broad for her opening remarks. Merci beaucoup. And uh, thank, thank you, you so much for inviting SIDA uh, to open this important seminar. As we all know, uh, the number of people in need of humanitarian protection and assistance keep growing. Um, and despite funding also growing to a to, to certain extents, we're constantly uh, falling short of the resources needed to respond to the needs of people in crisis. And it those appears obvious that we collectively need to work together to reduce those needs. 
And behind uh, a major part of the needs that we respond to is violence and abuse being perpetrated against civilians. And we believe that, therefore, protection has to be at the center of humanitarian action with a clear focus on preventing such violence uh, from being perpetrated in the first place. This while at the same time, of course, providing a quality response to those that have been affected by violence and are in need of services. But we believe that to ensure that protection is firmly placed at the center of humanitarian action and that collective efforts are made to reach protection outcomes, or in other words, reducing protection risks, a strong humanitarian leadership commitment to address acute protection challenges, collective responsibility and increased adv advocacy on protection risks are needed. And this was also recommended by last year's independent uh, review uh, of the Interagency Standing Committee Protection Policy. But given the complexity of protection risks, it's also important to stress that they cannot be addressed by humanitarian actors alone. We therefore see that uh, enhanced attention to protection from a nexus perspective is required. Uh, we need to encourage and support more common understanding, coordination and synergies with um, peace building or community peace building projects and humanitarian rights uh, actors, um, human rights actors, for example. But we also see a need to be more inclusive in humanitarian protection. But with millions of people threatened by conflict, the capacity of humanitarian actors to protect them remains insufficient. And there is not enough capacity within the existing mechanism to improve the safety and security of these people. In addition, the lack of access to people in need of protection and for affected population to access protection and assistance make it even more important to think about how protection can be done differently or rather building on what is already done by protection uh, actors, local actors, sorry, the light, uh, local actors uh, and communities themselves on the ground. And I think today's meetings emphasize the importance of community-led protection, initiatives led by national local actors and by communities are a corner cornerstone in efforts to reducing the risks that affected people face. Learning how to best support and enable such initiative through adopting a truly inclusive, people-centered and community-led approaches together with our partners is crucial uh, for CEDA. Um, we see it as absolutely crucial also to develop and strengthen capacities, methods and tools, enhancing the system's capacity to reach collective protection outcomes in terms of reduced risks of violence, coercion and deliberate deprivation. Um, but we also see that the work of humanitarian and protection actors who are proactively addressing threats to civilians in co conflict often remains unnoticed. And that's uh, partly due to the challenges in uh, proving and showing success of the prevention work. We think it's a priority for us to support initiatives to develop methods to measure the impact of risk reduction and contribute to building the necessary evidence base uh, with partners such as NRC and Oxfam. We see that today humanitarian aid focused to a large extent on delivery of goods and services. And if we are to reduce the risk of violence and abuse, we have to focus much more on what can be done to prevent it from happening and thereby proactively protect affected population. I think we as donors, we can ask those questions to our partners, we can keep an open dialogue, um, and we need to focus more on the actual outcome of people being protected um, and focus maybe a little bit, a little bit less on the number of people reached by services. CEDA's humanitarian unit where I work is currently also assessing how we can support national and local actors more directly, not only through funding, but also to meaningfully participate and have an equal seat at the table in decision-making for us at all levels. Um, locally led interventions are key in prevention and proactive protection. 
um, including uh, by local actors and communities identifying risk, reducing uh, the threat and vulnerabilities, and also to help increasing the capacity of the most vulnerable uh, people to resist prevailing threats. And of course, finally, we are strongly committed to providing flexible and multi-year funding to our partners to support principled engagement, relationship building, and trust uh, in, uh, in addition to sustained access and response. I'm going to end here, but just to say that I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to engage with you all today and to learn more about what works and what donors such as CEDA can do to facilitate community-led approaches to advance prevention and proactive protection. So a big thank you already to GPC and community-led protection task team and all other organizations involved in this event. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Madame Broad, for... Uh, thank you so message. much, Ms. Broad, for your opening remarks. I'm sure that protection will be at the heart of humanitarian action. But to do so, we need leadership, we need lobbying and awareness raising. Given the recent vision from the we know that um, the work that we do is more and more needed. Humanitarian actors and protection actors work proactively to face threats against civilians in conflict, but this is often unseen due to the fact that it can be difficult to prove these successes of prevention work. The current model of financing and implementation is often difficult and we do not often see the work of actors who are trying to strengthen a proactive approach towards protection. Today's topic is important and this is seen in the number of community groups who have gathered in the Gaza Strip over the last few weeks. As first respondents in the face of terrible, unimaginable situations, and together they are carrying out activities to try and protect members of their community. They are sharing important information and they are helping communities to access the services that they need. These community actors are safeguarding local know-how that they use in the most difficult of circumstances. We believe that community-based approaches and self-protection allow us to make progress in terms of protection, taking into account resources needed for community groups, because they are agents of their own protection. My organization works in Burkina Faso, where they are struck by recurring attacks, armed attacks perpetrated in various regions of the country. Over the last two years, there have been at least three attacks that have killed huge numbers, over 150, a second 80, a third 50 killed. And this also causes mass displacement over 2 million displaced people. There is a crisis in terms of protection and it's becoming more and more essential. And this is linked to a food crisis. Also within a context of the destruction of the socioeconomic foundations and communication foundations. There's also a political crisis that is hurting the entire state. There have been two coups d'etat in 2022. Burkina Faso has a partnership with Oxfam and are carrying out actions based on two main aspects, reducing protection threats and reducing the vulnerability of persons who are subject to a protection threat. Through these actions, we are working to strengthen capacity and to ensure the prevention 
and management of protection issues. This is done by information sharing, awareness raising, and capacity building. This is based on community know-how and anchored in community know-how. We do this to improve their management of protection issues. These actions, the use of local expertise and lessons learned allow us to improve our interventions every day so that we can effectively work against protection-based issues. We will now watch a video prepared by Ms. Reboyo from the Apoyar organization. This showcases the work of our organization with local communities in Colombia. Here is the video. Good morning. My name is Ina Vanessa. I'm subdirector of Apoyar. I've been working for 10 years in community strengthening projects for the coordination of projects for humanitarian response with my experience in uh, topics ranging from um, reproductive and sexual rights, migration, and so forth. My commitment is to promote human rights and to generate a positive impact on society by strengthening protection spaces for women in my territory in Arauca, in Colombia. I've been part of Apoyar for nine years. It's a civil society with 22 years in experience in implementing projects in Arauca, Colombia. And it's uh, actually a bet for hope in a critical moment in our territory with a firm commitment that we can change those excluding ways of relating with one another in order to create a more humanitarian and equalitarian community. We believe in respect, the recognition of one another, diversity and transparent relationships because they strengthen human capacities in order to live together. And that's why your actions focus on working hand by hand with communities by identifying needs, understanding challenges, the dynamics, local dynamics, and recognizing opportunities, strengths, and capabilities of people who are present locally. We believe that the transformation of realities in which we live can only be guaranteed with the active participation of communities in the design, decision-making, and implementation of projects that will impact them through consultations, open dialogues with the community, um, capability assessment, and implementation of feedback loops, we can have an adaptive programming that can gather all of the opportunities to improve that the communities might identify, and we also provide full transparency. Likewise, one of our objectives is to leave capabilities in local communities by developing skills and strengthening natural leadership and organization skills from women so that they can be autonomous in their decision making and they can have communication with uh, decision makers in all different levels so that they can guarantee their rights. And that's why we do different initiatives with public entities, with the community, by using resources and knowledge so that we can provide more effective solutions. That's why the projects that we implement, they need to include long-term actions. Arauco is a department that still needs immediate action because we have a triple affectation in, historically marked by armed conflict and climate change. And the state doesn't have enough capabilities to cover the needs of the communities. And that's why these actions need to be addressed to cause a transformative impact that is sustainable for communities. Now we're going to show you a video that we prepared for you with the actions that we developed in our project of humanitarian action to protect women and people who belong to LGBTQ community, which we implemented with Oxfam Colombia, and it's financed by ASTI. Thank you very much.
El Departamento de, Department of Arauca is a territory that suffers triple affectation as it is historically marked by the armed conflict of different non-state armed groups that have fought over the territory. It has also been affected by migration, which has been confronted with large gaps in institutional response and climate variability disasters affecting the migrant population and the host population. The humanitarian assistance project to protect women, migrants with diverse sexual and gender orientations, migrants in transit, and host communities from Venezuela in the Department of Arauca, Colombia, is implemented in partnership with Oxfam Colombia and funded by the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, ACTIT, which aims to increase the protection of migrant women and people with diverse sexual orientations and gender identities in transit from Venezuela, who aim to permanently establish host communities and humanitarian assistance in the Department of Arauca. Two components are implemented. From the mobile tent, we carried out guidance, training in sexual and reproductive menstrual rights, advice and access to contraceptive methods, rapid pregnancy tests, rapid tests for sexually transmitted infections, and we also delivered menstrual management kits, micronutrients, and kits for pregnant women. We also identify uh, routes and we do follow-up in cases of gender-based violence, and we also provide assessments in the areas of nursing, psychosocial, and legal sectors. Protection route awareness, raising on protection risk, rights services, delivery, and differential nursing assessment, psychosocial care, cash transfer, and access to humanitarian transport covering the Arauca route and cities within the country to women and their families in transit condition. We try to provide comprehensive care and a safe support network to these women. We also strengthen local community actors and Arauca institutions on fundamental rights and migrant rights. We also do prevention campaigns from xenophobia and discrimination, gender-based violence, and promotion of health in coexistence with communities with the aim of strengthening their capacities and mitigating protection risks. With the support we provide through the protection route, we have been able to provide care to women and their families with a transit travel plan in dignified conditions and additionally covering the immediate needs that arise, as we did with Maria, a 19-year-old woman, a migrant in transit to Ecuador. During the stress, she reported symptoms such as vomiting and dizziness. She received medical attention and a pregnancy test was performed on her and turned out positive. And that's why she decided to undergo the IVF in coordination with the first international emergency. The procedure is guaranteed in safe conditions, covering food, accommodation, medical and psychological support. Days after the procedure, with medical authorization, the participant continued her route to Ecuador. The interpreters apologize. Oh, Alain, sorry, can the you unmute yourself? Oh, there you go. Yes, thank you very much um, for having shared uh, this video on Colombia's experience. And without further ado, we will now listen to Ms. Kalungero. She comes from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where she does coordination work at GATOP. Good morning, everyone. I am uh, Yolande Colunguero, and I am from the organization Gaia, that is a group of organizations uh, defending rights of the populations, but also peace building. I am based in the city of Bukimbo. 
I would like here to quickly present our actions on community-based protection. We work a lot when it comes to protecting civil population in the North Kivu province and in the Lubero territory. So for our interventions and our community-based protection actions, we try to contribute to civil protection and during our work, we also use like key messages in our communication. And I think we could summarize that in a four. So you have to acknowledge the population. And first of all, really make sure that the population has information on their rights as citizens to promote this uh, communication of information. We have some uh, raising awareness sessions that are organized in different villages. We gather men, women together and we try to really reinforce their rights. In the DRC, in the North Kivu province, Unfortunately, it's a very violent area of the country. There's a lot of conflict. And sometimes people kind of lose sight of what are their rights in this context. So this is why for our protection-based um, actions, we really try to promote all this visibility, all this information on national legal framework. We also try to provide a lot of additional information to displaced populations. We look at maps that we share with them to try to identify the different services that can be made available to them. And we share this information with the local population and with the displaced population. This information can then be used in case of a need by the local population or by the displaced population. We also try to promote collaboration between the local population and the civil authorities, local authorities but also the military authorities. So when I say civil authorities, we are talking about uh, the chief of the village. So in the North Kivu, we have a lot of villages who have um, a chief who's in charge of uh, running the village. And it's good to have this link between the population and the authorities. In some villages, you don't really have a representative of the government. You have to go through the chief of the village. So here again, our message is to reinforce that the villagers have rights, that the displaced populations have rights. So to still work on actions based on the community, we also conduct some advocacy work. At local level, we organize activities for men, activities for women, and it's actually good so that these um, men and women can then be the ambassadors of their own communities and spread the word, spread this information. What we also try to do, because it is a very difficult situation when there is conflict, when there is violence, we also try to uh, explain people how, how to react 
faced with violence. So there is some uh, very uh, basic knowledge on human rights uh, that uh, we've also uh, mentioned in these sessions with men and with women. So when it comes to violence, in for, unfortunately, some people are arrested without giving any reasons. Some are illegal detentions. Some people are killed. There is forced labor. There is land grabbing. There is a sexual violence. The interpreter apologizes, I think, uh, Mrs. Calungero lost her connection. La connection de Yolande bloqué. It seems that uh, okay. Yolanda is uh, facing some technical issues. On va peut-être voir si on peut revenir sur Yolande. So maybe we'll give um, the floor to Yolande a little later. Oh, I think she's back. Okay, merci. Thank you, my apologies. I think I mentioned uh, our messages, and I hope you, you heard all these different messages and uh, that we use in our communication with the local population. But despite the fact that we are in a difficult context, we can see that there is improvement possible and that we can see the result of our work, of our uh, awareness work, or our advocacy work. Because we see that thanks to all these uh, messages and these uh, uh, interventions uh, based uh, with the community, the population has the means to really better understand uh, what's happening and also to sometimes be able to go to the police station or to the local authority and claim their rights. And also we can see that the, the people now just go to the services when they need access to these services because they know it's their right. I'm sorry, I think Yolande is having some technical issues again. Okay. Yeah. Alors, on va peut-être poursuivre. On verra All right, si so should we continue? And then maybe we will uh, ask Yolande if she would like to conclude her presentation a little later. But I think from what we heard from Yolande, I think it's a very good thing uh, to start with like uh, strengthening capacities for the communities, enabling the communities to understand their rights and enable them to take action. So we'll see later if we have time and maybe we can... Um, Again, I listen to the end of the presentation of Yolon, but let me now ask Mrs. Abdi in Somalia if you can now also present the context in Somalia. You have the floor. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'll just wait for the presentation to come up. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, so I'll, I think I'll have my video on because it keeps, uh, I keep losing focus of the screen until I'm able to finish. Okay, thanks so much for having me join the forum. I'll go ahead and share an example of our efforts uh, working with communities in Somalia as local protection actors and efforts of advancing protection and advocating for more proactive uh, protection approaches. Next slide. 
Uh, so as Riado, we are a local NGO in Somalia. Our decade-long experience and commitment has led to a profound understanding of the challenges as well as unique opportunities uh, for interventions in our protection sector, particularly within the context of Southwest State Region. And it has also been incredible at how the partnership we've managed to forge with the community through their social legal system, known as the HER, which is X E E R, um, and it has it has been a transformative tool both to our social sexual stroke gender-based violence as well as uh, uh, child protection. Uh, next slide. So uh, under our protection approach as Riado, it has been, um, uh, the approach has been focused in, has been rooted in uh, rebuilding the community social structures, uh, empowering individuals and groups to realize their rights, uh, enhancing the capacity of these uh, of these communities to prevent social problems and effectively dealing with those that do arise. And we've been, we've managed to do this through investing in capacity building uh, and capacity building of the of these communities on human rights as well as social cohesion. And over the years, this has proven to be successful in uh, various contexts, including uh, those of conflict as well as prevention. Next slide. So uh, just uh, so we understand, if, uh, a number of us might know, like uh, Somalia is a country that has been dealing with a uh, crisis after crisis for the last uh, three decades, and the women and uh, kids who make up majority of the population are the ones who are left to deal with this protection risk of displacement, uh, all, all of various forms of forced, uh, direct violence, forced eviction, family separation, as well as uh, denial of access to basic services. And each aftermath of this protection um, and aftermath of these uh, climate and conflict induced emergencies, we see a spike in uh, a spike in cases of uh, separated children and unaccompanied children within the IDPs, as well as uh, we are left to deal with. Uh, uh, we are left to deal with uh, a surge in GBV cases of uh, particularly uh, against women and girls, and uh, the highest form reported being uh, those of intimate uh, intimate partner violence uh, for uh, FGM, uh, forced child marriages, as well as uh, rape uh, being rampant again within the IDP communities. And these are the kind of cycles we are trying to break up and empower the community at risk. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So the health system, the one we are currently in partnership with and working through to reach the community, these are constitution of the Council of Elders together with the traditional leaders being the clan leaders, tribal leaders, uh, religious leaders as well as uh, at this point we can even include the camp leaders. And um, uh, the, this system has traditionally and even up to date through incorporation of the Sharia law into its framework been responsible for maintaining social order, shaping the local norms and uh, currently in some way they do continue to shape the modern legal framework as well as the constitution of the country. And uh, through this system, the community has maintained, uh, has had its own ways of self-protection as well as conflict resolution. And it, this is something we need to give them credit for. Uh, in, uh, they have like a, a community care-like system for the kids without uh, primary protection, like uh, parents or close relatives, where they will be sent to religious schools known as kafala to be taken care of until they're able to stand on their own for the community for the uh, for the for the conflict resolution the system uh, the system adopts the retribution justice to as a way of uh, maintaining harmony within the family clan and the general uh, community as a whole next slide as, as much as this uh, health system has been working for the community it hasn't been perfect uh, all in all uh, it has had it, its own uh, challenges where like uh, for the for the for the community care these uh, these approach only embraced the younger boys excluding the girls and any any boys above the age of 13 years old uh, this is because at 13 one is considered an adult and is expected to take up responsibility in terms of contributing to the family to the family financially the boys were expected to take up work while the girls were prepared for marriage as a way of lessening the burden to the family so uh, and for the when it came to GBV, uh, when it came to conflict resolution, when the cases were involving women, the system did tend to to be a bit oppressive and uh, in considering to the rights of the women and girls. And this was more evident during uh, when they were dealing with cases of GBV, where the in efforts of uh, preserving the family's honor as well as uh, the the reputation of the families, the, the women and girls were coerced into accepting either compensation or marriage to the perpetrator. 
normally marriage was the ultimate solution for the younger unmarried girls next slide and these are the kinds of uh, of uh, these are the kinds of approaches uh, and the concerns and gaps we are trying to address within the system uh, uh, as well as together with the wider community so in addressing this, uh, we're trying to bridge the gap between traditional values and the modern human rights uh, principle under the One UN, as well as the constitution. And we've been gradually involving the community, the leaders, uh, the local leaders, the community in a gradual capacity building training session on uh, human, right, uh, human rights uh, with emphasis on uh, women as well as children's rights. And uh, throughout the years, these uh, and we are focusing on uh, promoting gender sensitivity and survivor centered approaches because we understand these are catalyzed. These are uh, they are catalyzed the change within the that to to ensure catalyzed change within the community. Uh, through this health system has also been uh, a vital tool in our child protection, we, where we are utilizing the 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 health local networks, channels, and knowledge to accelerate our IDTR uh, efforts. This is identification, uh, documentation, tracing, and reunification of these separated and unaccompanied children within the IDP communities back to their family. Uh, after successful reunification, we through these links, we maintain a follow up with the family to see how the child is uh, is a go is is a progressing within uh, then their reunited family. And the, throughout the years, this has been uh, this has proven successful. Where we are next slide. Where we are now. Uh, where we are now. Where we are now uh, documenting a, a impressive behavior change within the community. Now we are seeing a, like a more and more legal, uh, gender sensitive legal framework being implemented within the the head, the local systems, as well as the courts, where survivor centered approaches are gaining momentum. Uh, more and more leaders within the health system are joining in and advocating for us, uh, for just the legal justice, as well as, as well as right best approach when dealing with cases. and. And the wider community has also uh, has also shown great uh, support, and they are shifting towards a positive attitude when it comes to matters of dealing with the GBV. Where before it was considered a stigma to even uh, talk about it, but now they're joining in, speaking against it more outly, making it uh, easier for the survivors to reach out and seek support in medical, both medical as well as legal. Uh, for the we're also in action advocating for for the international frameworks uh, as well as domesticated policies such as the ratified CRC that uh, identify and protects any child under the, anyone under the age of 18 to be being implemented and actively being acted upon within these uh, within the local system. Next slide. So we've uh, been considering the majority of this affected that the IDP communities, we've gone a step further in, uh, we've managed to establish child-friendly spaces. This is not only to provide the kids with a safe environment, but also uh, but also for an, uh, an opportunity for recreation as well as skill development. Uh, for the school age children, we are currently trying to have them enrolled in our recently resumed education programs, uh, as well as in talks with the Kafala system, the religious schools, to see a way of integrating secular education into their curriculum. Uh, as as, our, as our, our local organization, we're also trying to expand our work beyond the capacity building on human rights to include uh, efforts of social cohesion as well as conflict resolution. Uh, currently, we're working with a project of six months, but uh, we anticipate it holds much promise, and this hope is coming from the community's positive attitude. However, re re realistically speaking, these are areas that require immense uh, commitment, and this is where we are trying. We are reaching out to the uh, global community to the seek uh, support in terms of capacity as well as uh, as well as resources. Uh, next slide. For the recommendation, we'll just like to see more collaboration with the local NGOs such as us, and where we are, we are also provided more more support in terms of capacity as well as uh, as well as uh, capacity as well as resources. We like to see more the communities being uh, engaged actively from the design to the implementation of the projects. These are because it also ensures the initiatives are more culture sensitive, and also we like to see more investment on the education and. Uh, and awareness because uh, we've seen uh, and it, we've also it's approved they are uh, they are the catalyst for promoting understanding and behavior change within the communities and we'll also like to see investment in long term sustainability interventions such as uh, social cohesion and conflict preventions thank you so much i think uh, 
Très intéressant. Merci beaucoup. Euh... Very interesting presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Abdi, for uh, sharing these interventions uh, in Somalia. And now, our last speaker in uh, coming from Ukraine, Mrs. Rodas here, working with the communities um, here based on the front line in Ukraine. Welcome, and you have the floor. Yeah, so hello, I'm finally here. My name is Tatiana Kutas and I am representative of national organization, the 10th of April, that is operating in Ukraine. Next slide, please. I will shortly tell you about the situation in Ukraine this, uh, and our experience of work uh, with community groups in this context. Next slide, please. The armed aggression of Russia against Ukraine started in 2014 and led to the internal displacement of more than one and a half million of Ukrainians. Next slide, please. The second phase of war uh, began in February 2022 and caused an unprecedented humanitarian crisis in all regions of the country. Ukrainian cities, towns and villages have been systematically struck by rockets and drones, while areas closer to the fighting are suffering from bombardments, artillery and mortar shelling. Next slide, please. About 32 million people were directly or indirectly affected by the war. Next slide, please. The ongoing nature of the conflict and active hostilities, shelling of civilian objects, lead to the aggravation of the situation of the most vulnerable categories. Next slide. About 6 million Ukrainians were forced to leave the territory of Ukraine in search of safety, and 5 million were internally displaced. Next slide. In this situation, the first ones who started to respond to the needs in humanitarian aid, safe evacuation, social support, were communities on the ground, also those ones that were previously supported by our organization. Next slide, please. These communities started to collect and deliver food, hygiene, medicines, water, conduct informing, conduct evacuation, establish and accept people in shelters. Next slide, please. Our organization has been supporting communities, refugees communities, IDPs communities, and host communities in Ukraine since 2016. These communities groups are associations of proactive individuals united around one goal. Our interventions are designed to help the larger community in general, but through the community-based groups who implement their initiatives. For their support, we are using different approaches and tools, as all communities are unique and require individual approach. Next slide, please. Our stages of work with community groups is, firstly, identification of existing associations and groups, second, capacity and needs assessment, thirdly, development of capacity empowerment plan, then plan implementation, and after this, assessment of the progress and plan amendment. Also, we are trying to apply different approaches. One of them is support uh, activities are based only on the request on the communities. After the consultations with them and with their active involvement to the process of activities development. Secondly, we use individual and flexible approach to every community. And also we are adopting cross pillar approach as in all the activities we are trying to involve representatives of refugees, IDPs and host communities and enhancing experience sharing and development of their common initiatives. Next slide, please. To support communities, we are using different tools, such as meetings and consultations on constant base, awareness raising sessions, educational activities, such as trainings, mentoring, coaching, master classes, youth schools, individual courses. Next slide, please. Also, dialogue platforms, interregional, regional, local one, public events, general meetings, forums, award ceremonies, 
effectiveness of these tools depends on the situation of every community and on their requests. Also, uh, next slide, please. We are using such support as, pro, uh, as uh, production of media materials, advocacy support, and informing. Next slide, please. Also, we pay very big attention to establishment of safe spaces of communities and support of their initiatives through in-kind assistance or through cash grants. One of great examples of such initiatives is the initiative of group of internally displaced women in the city that is very close to the fighting zone and uh, is constantly under the shelling. The aim of their initiative was to caring of internally displaced women who left the occupation. Uh, and uh, the aim was restoring their psycho-emotional and physical condition, socializing and integrating women into the local community, expanding their circle of communication. They are doing it through the creation of safe space and also organizing psychosocial support activities based on the needs of uh, their women who, uh, about whom they are paid. Next slide, please. As a result of our support, as from organization, communities enhance their capacity to develop activities and respond to the protection needs of themselves, effectively using local potential. Such activities take into account the needs in the best possible way, promptly respond to emergency situations and ensure sustainability. Next slide, please. Communities grew their capacity to make needs assessment and develop based on these activity plans that have a result in advancing prevention and proactive protection. Such support allows people to, to respond to the needs of people even in small and remote locations in an efficient and constant way and ensure the sustainability of the results. And uh, next slide, please. Based on our experience, we developed the recommendations. Next slide, please. To donors and to representatives of international uh, NGOs to implement flexible multi-year programs directed on the support of communities development and support of the initiatives of the communities. And the recommendation to the uh, local NGOs to put as much as you can efforts to identify proactive individuals and support them on constant basis using individual approach to each community and selection of appropriate tools for every community to develop with them jointly activity plans and support their initiatives by grants of different types, in-kind or cash grants. Actually, that's all. Thank you very much for the attention. And I will be happy uh, uh, to answer to your questions in the written um, if you would like. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Madame Tatiana Kutas. Pour Thank ces... you so much, Ms. Tatiana Kutas, for such an interesting um, report on the Ukrainian context, especially the areas close to the front line where we are aware of the challenges, both in terms of protection and in terms of security. So, Après avoir attendu, so much, uh, ces exemples, having heard hein? such inspiring examples, we would now like to move on to the group work. You can now discuss the topics in smaller groups. The groups will be organized by region and will be carried out in different languages. We have a total of six groups, five of which will go into their different meeting rooms and one of them will remain here in the plenary. Please note that group who will be here in the plenary Les différents groups sont les suivants. La salle 1. The groups are as follows. Room 1 Latin is les... for Latin America and the Caribbean. This group will be discussing the topics in Spanish. Room 2 is for the Middle East, discussed in Arabic. Room 3 is for Africa. There are two for Africa. This first one will be in French. The... 
the program is on Africa yeah. for Africa, but again in English. From four is Europe plus Asia plus the Pacific area that will take place in English. And finally, in the plenary room. Um, and by the way, we all come all come back here for an overall discussion, but the discussion taking place in the plenary will be interpreted. In a moment, my colleagues will open up the different group rooms. So please do join the room that interests you the most, obviously taking language into account because there will be no interpretation in different groups. Within the groups, you will have 15 minutes to discuss the um, information you've just heard and to share your own experiences. There will be a moderator in each room and they will offer question to direct your discussion and you are free to um, to follow their directions or not. It's just a way of um, utilizing your time more effectively. You will also have a blank table where you can share your comments and the information you share in writing. When we all come back together in the plenary, the moderator of each room will share the um, one or two of the main points that you raised, and we will try and put everything together into one document that we will share via the website. You can now move into your different groups and I hope you enjoy your discussions. You only have 15 minutes, so unfortunately there is not time for everybody to speak. You'll need to organize yourselves well to get the most out of these discussions. I hope you all have a good session and we will meet again in the plenary to summarize. Elena, I'm going oui. to... Hi, Elaine. I'm going to allow uh, the participants to unmute themselves in the plenary uh, so that you can have a discussion here. Um, if anyone needs help moving into a room, please just put it into the chat and we will move you. OK, just let us know which room you'd like to go into. And Yabawa, you've got your hand raised. Do you want to go into a particular room? Yes, madam. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Which room would you like to go into? Uh, yes, my own is more of a general general concern that I want to raise. Oh, a general uh, question. OK, yeah. um, bear yes. with us just one moment. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. And Alain is going to be leading the, the session here in the plenary for the global. So um, I will hand it back over to him. And uh, All right. thank you. Okay, merci. Alors, donc, yes, uh, very well, thank you. I think that people are still going into the different groups. <laughs> we just have 15 minutes. We have various questions that can guide us in our work, and we can then note down the main um, points that come up in this plenary room group. The first question is as follows. How does this community approach, how is this community approach different from the usual protection programs? This is uh, something that we can discuss. I'll take all questions, but then we can come back together to see how we can approach everything. So I'll just go through the questions first. Secondly, when can an organization decide to adopt a certain, this type of approach? Thirdly, what are factors that are favorable for certain approaches? And what are, what key things need to already be in place for a certain approach to be used, like factors such as community cohesion, community structures and mechanisms, the will of the community, etc. And how to strengthen the spirit of prevention in our colleagues who are working in programming. 
And finally, what means can be used for international NGOs to support um, closer ties between groups working on protections and especially working with civil society in the front line? So what lessons have you identified and that could be applied to protection work in the future in situations of conflict. So these are the types of questions that you can use to guide your discussion today in your group work. So has everybody understood what we what needs to be done? So let's move back to the first question. How does, is a community approach different from the usual protection programs? So this community approach within the scope of protection work, how is it different from what is usually done? Hello? Hello. Yes, hello, Victor, go ahead. Hello. Yes, hello. You can go ahead. I wanted to say we are in the DRC. So how, I want to know how you get into group three. Sorry, who was that that wanted to move to group three? Can you put your, just put a message in the chat for us and we'll move you. Okay, merci. Very good, thank you. Okay. Very well. I think we can start the discussion. We can discuss the first question. Does nobody wish to take the floor? Okay. Very well. I can see that there is a hand raised. Annie Laure, we're listening to you now. Yes, hello. Thank you for having given me the floor. I believe that this approach is the most appropriate when it comes because it allows communities to participate as much as possible to efforts that are designed for them. It's important to involve communities in actions that are for them, and it will also enable them to take measures. And finally, they will feel more of a sense of appropriation when it comes to activities that they participate in. If they had a role in putting them together. This participation will help enable good results as actions are taken. Thank you. Merci yes, thank you. Thank you for sharing your ideas. You've said that it's the most appropriate response. It allows populations to be strongly involved and to be really engaged with what's happening, which then leads to success. Thank you so much. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Gracia. I'm sorry, I couldn't see where to raise my hand. Yes. Yes, hello, everybody. Gracia, I'm here from the Repu Central African Republican. Republic. When we put communities at the center of our work, we do need to add that this approach 
is not without challenges. The interpreter does apologize. The, the sound of the speaker is quite poor, so this message might be incomplete. The interpreter will resume when the sound is better. The interpreter reiterates that the sound of the speaker is poor and so the interpreting will be incomplete. The interpreter will resume when the sound is better. We apologize for this inconvenience. The interpreter resumes. Thank you very much. We'll try and take one next speaker before moving on to another speaker. I can see that Jeremy Alama has his hand raised. Jeremy. The speaker has his microphone switched off. Your microphone is switched off, Jeremy. Jeremy. Jeremy, I see. Hello. Hello. Ah, we hear you now. Yes, hello everybody. My name is Jeremy. I am a community engagement and accountability officer. We have many protection cases here, so this approach is different from the normal standard approach. Why? Because it recognizes that we have a mission to provide protection and ideas of protection to the communities that we serve. Now, this approach recognizes that the community itself already has assets and foundations that are useful for their own protection. So the approach values the community in itself. It allows the community to participate more and the approach allows the community to see how they can defend themselves. We can only improve what they can already do and strengthen collaboration so they can become more resilient. It also enables the community to gain more trust in terms of creating sustainability, sustainable actions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for your uh, comment. Let's continue with the next question. So can one, when can an organization decide so when can you decide as an organization to adopt such an approach oui. any ideas any prerequisites oh, i see a hand raised arunga Hello, everyone. Okay, yes, go ahead. Je suis pas trop francophone. Je parle anglais, mais je vais essayer en français. I will try in French, but um, oui. I am a, an English speaker. C'est pas facile d'atteindre les communautés. Donc, dans ce type de situation. So it's really not easy to reach the communities and to implement these activities. So you really have to decide on the right moment. It's about timing. All right, thank you. Next um, Next comment, so it's about uh, deciding to adopt this approach and when 
is that feasible? And hello? Hello? Earlier, I uh, forgot to say that we are based in Yaoundé as an organization. I believe that uh, there are some prerequisites in your activities if you decide to adopt this approach. You have to understand that, of course, when your action needs to be implemented in the, in the community, you need involvement of the community. And I think that's kind of uh, obvious. You need to really, from the very beginning, include the population. If you're talking about a community-led approach, a community-led action, you will need, of course, to involve the community. So you really have to, from the designing of this action, involve the community, or at least have the community in mind, and have really this this um, this whole idea of how you can involve the community. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so let me just uh, uh, here move on to the last questions. What are the uh, favorable factors to this approach? Alain, uh, quickly. Apologies to interrupt, Alain, but some one of the co-hosts closed the room, so you'll be joined by all of the other rooms Aye, in just a few seconds. D'accord. Okay. All right. Thank you. Are we all here? Yes, everyone is here. Welcome back. So I hope you had time to um, have interesting discussions. And our group, uh, it was a uh, very interesting. I would like to ask a representative of each group to maybe briefly share one or two items that were mentioned in the group. So just very briefly, please. So the first room, Lina, please. Hello, thank you. We did have received several comments, but we weren't able to move past the first question. The first question focused on the difference between a community-based approach and the traditional protection program. All the people in the room agreed that whilst there were some differences, they were also complementary. So the conclusion we can reach based on the comments made in the breakout room was that whilst they are complementary, the protection program is focused on immediate, immediate assistance, taking into account risks and also providing services, goods in the most critical moment for a community. Whilst the community-based approach is looking more in the long term so that communities can participate, have more active participation as part of the process, also recognizing all the protection mechanisms developed by the communities, which can, whilst international and local organizations may be aware of the context, the communities are the ones that leave firsthand all the challenges arising from the context and are the ones that when we arrive with some possible solutions the communities are the ones that have already developed other protection mechanisms to protect themselves so the community-based approach it's also it also contributes to the resilience of the communities thank you over to you
Thank you very much. And uh, Sarah, room two. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, the first point I would like to add, there is a consensus uh, based on the uh, uh, based community activity. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the society is a recipient. They are the, the programs uh, are already there. The second point, the local authority and the local NGOs, they are helping uh, individuals. in many uh, phases, especially if some crisis is more explored than others, the implementation is needed in this context. Thank you very much, Sarah. Yolande, uh, room three. Thank you very much. In room three, I think on top of what's been already said by my colleagues in, in other rooms, we emphasize the fact that um, once the community has the uh, the right level of knowledge and information, then it's very useful to also involve the local authorities to find solutions. So we had a very interesting experiences uh, shared, uh, including by the experience in Burkina Faso. And uh, we also actually uh, had the time to cover the favorable factors saying that protection in general within the community is a sustainable solution for protection. This enables resilience building within the community and this is how we can also promote um, access to different basic services. And just to conclude, Mrs. Armel also shared with us that the community-based protection promotes the involvement of all the stakeholders of the community to find solutions, sustainable solutions, and involving all the leaders at all levels. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yolande, for sharing room three and room four. Amina. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for our uh, room. Uh, we, I think we reached also a consensus where we identified like this community are much different from the uh, traditional one, where we it focuses on uh, increasing ownership of the of the community, where involving the community throughout the implementation, the design, uh, ensuring that it tailors the needs of the of the interventions to the community's needs as well as the local norms. Uh, it was uh, for the. Adoption, why when to adopt this approach where 
came up with uh, the need uh, because of there was need to align the protection efforts with the local culture norms uh encourage the community is willing that when the community is willing and capable of actively participating in protection activities and also there is desire to foster sustainability and long term uh for the community resilience uh the enabling factor was one of our uh, participant pointed out it was a uh, the, the most important should be trust the uh, trust with the for to form trust with the, the communities because uh, once trust is instilled the, the all the remaining process just becomes easier to implement and for the the lesson for the how the international geopol become a support to the local to the civil society in, in efforts of bridging the gap with the national clusters uh, we identified the providing training uh, and capacity for these local organizations and enhancing the partic participation uh, in the clusters as a way of sustaining the protection efforts. Uh, the, uh, for the lessons we came up with, uh, uh, we need to really recognize and empower the local actors, and also uh, we should emphasize on promoting community inter involvement, focusing on long-term interventions as long as conflict prevention as well as uh, social cohesion. Which also we 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 understand majority of uh, protection actors are. Uh, put this aside uh, where they only emphasize uh, interventions related to child protection or uh, uh, GBV and those kinds of while putting aside these long-term uh, interventions such as conflict prevention and social cohesion. But uh, we we well, we reach a consensus that this needs to be a priority in future. We like to see them being a priority in future. Thanks so much. Merci beaucoup, Amina. Thank you very much, Amina. Room five, Tetiana. Yeah. Uh, we have discussed a couple of questions and I can make like three conclusions from it. Uh, first of all, we should take into the consideration inclusion of persons with disabilities to the leading role in the work of community groups. The second one is uh, sometimes we face uh, the um, difficulties in establishing cooperation with local authorities, so we should try to find different approaches to establish with them cooperation or in cases when it is not possible to go through other channels and maybe to work more with communities, not to leave the people behind. And the last conclusion that I think is very important that as long as the conflict lasts or other situation, difficult situation for people last, so more difficult for communities it is to respond to their needs and they need more support. So thank you. And maybe uh, Rachel from my group want to add something. I think you covered everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So here in our group, to summarize, I think we uh, also agreed that um, here action-led, uh, a community-led action is also a way to empower the community. So the community can better implement action, minimize a risk and improve uh, the outcome. This is also about sustainable solutions. This is uh, how you can develop long-term actions so that when the uh, international partner leaves, then the solution that was implemented can remain. That's it for our uh, group uh, here in the plenary session. Uh, thank you very much. And now we are going to thank everyone for this active participation. It was a very active workshop and before giving the floor uh, here to Samuel Chang for the final comments, I would like to uh, congratulate all the speakers today. Thank you for sharing all these examples of this work with the communities. Thank you very much for all your contributions. I would like to thank the interpreters as well. Thank you so much for your contribution to this session. And thank you, everyone. Thank you to the organizers. Uh, 
and thank you for debating with us this important topic. Thank you also to all those working in the background to organize such a great and dynamic session. Congratulations, everyone. Um, Samuel, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. And let me thank you for your brilliant moderation of this extremely important event. Um, I I'm going to echo uh, Amina from her, her group, which it was clear that there's consensus from the protection community that this is a priority for us going forward. Um, I was so impressed uh, first at our organizers, Oxfam, NRC, and GAD, HOP, for convening this event and, and really for uh, the remarkable interventions from around the world. We were able here to, to hear from Colombia, DRC, Somalia, Ukraine, and even more. Uh, in a convincing and, and, and exciting display of what the protection community uh, is doing in humanitarian emergencies around the world, uh, particularly on this issue of community-led protection, even self-protection, uh, to advance uh, prevention and proactive pro uh, protection. Uh, you know, our objective in protection in humanitarian emergencies is always to prevent or reduce harm to civilians and support the realization of their rights. And in that, our focus naturally begins with the duties of states, uh, of parties to conflict, of authorities from local to national levels to protect people. But our standard paradigm often focuses a lot on external actors uh, who provide the support, they assist the affected communities, and, and whereas the capacities of communities themselves is often, as we've heard, uh, less understood or less visible. Um, it's our focus on external actors who respond to immediate needs, who strengthen coping capacities and mechanisms, they strengthen resilience, they spotlight violations, etc. Uh, but keeping community capacities as just in their role as merely under the umbrella of targets uh, whose resilience needs to be built or coping mechanisms to be strengthened really sells short and does not recognize the extent uh, of how they can actively contribute uh, to their own protection. And, and so that's the challenge I think before us today. Can community-led protection appear not just as a footnote, but as the spearhead of funding and response plans across the humanitarian sector? Can theories of change start with the absolutely vital role of communities in achieving protection outcomes for those faced with crisis? Over the past number of years, this paradigm is shifting. Uh, we're increasingly recognizing the participation leadership of communities, even in the most complex crises around the world. And as a protection community, we are committed to this course. Uh, it's clear that community-led approaches offer a pathway for advancing prevention and response to protection risks by what? By giving control of decisions and resources to community groups as agents of their own protection. Uh, this is, of course, based on the recognition that community-based protection actors, well, they're the ones with the contextual knowledge, the relationships of trust with parties to conflict and community leaders, uh, whether they be chiefs in uh, village chiefs in the DRC to Mukhtars and other leaders around the world. Uh, it's also based on communities having the proximity and access needed to support the protection uh, of people in the most difficult uh, operating environments. One of the challenges before us here is to take that a step forward. Knowing community-led actions can contribute to achieving protection outcomes, how can we apply this across the range of protection outcomes and across the spectrum of responses from emergencies to longer-term recovery, from not just participating in and shaping program delivery, but actually in prevention and proactive protection? This is a joint endeavor. As a humanitarian community, we're striving to shift our focus more on preventing what is happening and thereby being proactive, not waiting for harm that's preventable to occur before taking action. Uh, and to quote Sarah Broad from CETA in our opening remarks, uh, how do we focus on people being protected and not just on the number of people reached by services? Well, we also know community and local actors can't and shouldn't have to do it alone. And so the question is for us as a broader sector, including international protection actors and allies, 
how do we support this shift? Is it through greater risk management and risk and sharing? Uh, is it in finding ways to amplify and accelerate these impacts? Uh, how do we ensure the needed funding and resources? And how can we work together in real partnership to further enable this type of local leadership, this community leadership in proactive and preventive protection? And once again, in the theme of this forum, in the hour of people's need. The Global Protection Cluster and its network of international and national partners, which includes the newly established task team on community-led protection, offers an opportunity to support greater visibility and investment, uh, deeper learning, stronger practices related to this vital area, which is community-led protection efforts as an enabler of proactive protection. Uh, I can say as the Global Protection Cluster, we as a community, we, all of our stakeholders are committed to promoting and supporting the critical role of affected people and communities in advancing their own protection. Protection is not an activity done for or on behalf of those affected by crisis. It is done by affected populations, and our job is obviously to further enable, support, and complement this. So once again, thank you so much, all of you who joined, and particular thanks to the organizers and, and Alain, your brilliant role in moderating uh, to Lena from Colombia, Yolan from DRC, uh, uh, Amina from Somalia, Tetiana, and all of those who were able to join us. It's so clear our, we as a protection community are united and in consensus and in order to advance these types of community-led protection approaches for proactive protection and prevention around the world. So thank you so much, and we look forward to advancing these efforts together.